I want to introduce uh, Miss 1995, Miss University of Georgia. She'll come on up here. The reason that's important is a couple of things. Gabe Ushery, stand up and let everybody see that sweatshirt you're wearing. It makes me feel good. Stand up, turn around, let them see it. Turn that way, all the way around. Um, I got a beef to pick with uh, Michael Thornton, Amber, their family. They, uh, their kids walk in this morning, I see a bunch of orange on them. You, you, you're from Tar Heel country, and all of a sudden you've been brainwashed. Uh, I guess the Thorntons are now Clemson fans. And Gabe, I just welcome you here. And you're, you're at the table of honor, and you deserve that. Also, I want to say about Miss Yeti, I don't know why I get so insecure when I hear someone with a great accent. No, it's, it's real. You got to turn that on. It's on. It's on. Um, like when I'm talking to Bob Heiner, it's a guy from Oklahoma, a guy from South Carolina. You don't realize how Southern you are until you hear like Miss Yeti talk. I know, it's so cool. Or uh, like I just love hearing like Gustavo talk. Or, mm -hmm. but I mean, I was at Walmart yesterday in the checkout line. There was a lady behind me, and she started talking, and I was like, and it was this beautiful English accent. Yep. And I'm like, right here in Walmart. <laughs> I have never felt insecure in Walmart, <laughs> and there it happened. I heard Ann one the other day. She was talking about, I didn't know what she was talking Toilet about. Toilet paper, she kept probably. Saying, tomatoes. Tomato. I think I'll need a fresh tomato. It doesn't sound like that. Have you ever, if you're from the South, have you ever heard yourself on a recording and you turn it off because you're embarrassed? <laughs> hey, welcome to the garden. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the garden. <laughs> All right, Wendy and I are going to have a 17-minute conversation <laughs> on uh, the Georgia-Alabama game coming up in two weeks. I'm kidding. Um, I have, uh, I don't know where this came from. I want to tell a story real quick, and then I'm going to read out of a, a wedding manual. I, I officiated a wedding the other night. Uh, Sam and I, I'm glad he's here this morning. That way I can embarrass him a little bit. Sam, what, raise your hand. Let everybody see you over there. My college freshman son. <laughs> we ordered uh, back when he was 12. What was the sexual purity curriculum? Who was that? Dennis? Passport to purity. Passport to purity. Highly recommend it. Woo! So it was, it was rough. So I took a pack of Nicorette gum and all that curriculum. They don't hold back. And we went to, you're supposed to get away from your town. And, uh, it's to a, a weekend trip. Oh, yeah. And we went to this hotel in, uh, <laughs> in Athens, Georgia. And these recordings, I mean, whew. You can't get pure without knowing what you're being. Yeah. I'm all about having a conversation on the birds and the bees. But nine sessions, an hour and a half a piece. By the time it was over, I just needed a break. And, um, a cigarette break. We were, <laughs> we were supposed to, I don't smoke, so don't, <laughs> I don't judge you. If you do, you'll see Abba quicker. Have at it. Um, that was funny. That's kind of true. Uh, Holy Spirit said, take Sam to go see the movie Everest. And you remember when that thing came out? I mean, it is like, Realistic, realistic. I'm, I'm, I've hiked around here, but I, I have no desire to go spend $100,000 and mm. hike Mount Everest. And if you've seen that movie, I mean, it is so real. It makes you feel cold when you watch it. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was writing a book called Mama Jane's Secret that we're going to retitle and republish with Destiny. And I got an hour download to where I cried and dictated out what the Holy Spirit was showing me about things about Mount Everest. And since then, God continues to talk to me about it. I mean, think about this. Where did the name Ascent come from? So I had an encounter in, I had, it's funny because it was a sexual purity weekend and somehow it turns into God talking to me about Everest and now we have a school called Ascent. And now Ascent is going to turn into K through 12. It all came from watching that movie and God was showing me some things. Over the years, uh, what he's basically shown me is this and then we'll jump into a conversation on spiritual death. Mm -hmm. Luke 9, 23. Okay. Most of us, no, I won't say most, a lot of us in this room, we came to Jesus because you honestly have no desire to spend an eternity in hell. That's me. Kevin Lutz, that was you. Was that anybody else? You was like, you had a revelation. That's, I wish I could tell you that mm -hmm. the idea of friendship with God was yeah. presented to me and he's the most kind, loving, tender person. I, no. Mm -hmm. I did the X's and O's and was like, I think, I think G, the message of Jesus sounds good to me compared to what I keep being presented at my Baptist church. If you died right now, would you go to be with God forever or burn in eternity in hell? Mm. 
Uh, it's convincing. It's a convincing message. I, I'll come down front. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Yeah. My brother still tells the story to this day. A revivalist came in. I swear to you, I'm not even going to say his name. We went down front every night. <laughs> to which Work I, out your salvation with fear and trembling. I do want to give the fundamentalists some credit. Uh, they get people out of hell. Yeah. I'm not kidding you. It's true. And then you go to trauma therapy the rest of your life. Also true. Um, yeah, that's also true. We started uh, around here, the conversations about seven years ago. What does it look like to walk in friendship with God? I want you to think about uh, these three stages. Matter of fact, go to Psalm 24 real quick. I was just thinking. Were you really? Yeah, because you were just talking about the purity weekend, and it was funny because that's where you got ascent. But yeah. who may ascend the mountain of God? Yeah, that's it right He here. who has clean hands and pure heart, who does okay. not lift a soul to another. You were thinking that verse? I was thinking it, absolutely. Wow. Okay, so Psalm 24, look right there. Psalm 24, 1 is where ascent came from. All right, let's think about literal Everest. Um, I once brought in someone that's been over there that he went to base camp. When you get to base camp, it takes like 20 days to acclimate. Mm -hmm. 20 days. I literally got winded last night running from my basement upstairs to get oh, something. Oh, come on. It would take me seven years to acclimate there. Um, and then you start ascending Everest, and it's rough. And then your reward before you get to the summit, I believe they break Everest up into five stages. This is what I want to talk about here. Two weeks ago, I said, Father, I don't feel like myself. I feel like you're exposing every raw emotion in me. I don't like it. I went to Amelia Island. I cried myself to sleep one night, didn't know why. And I'm thinking, this is weird. And he said, you're in the death zone with me. And there's some things I'm doing in you before you reside at the summit. Okay. So let's talk about, the, let's talk about literally Everest before we jump into the conversation we had in the car yesterday. The death zone is the literal zone right before you get to the summit at Everest. The air is so thin at the summit that they can only stay there for a few minutes. And except for a few Sherpas, every climber has to have oxygen or you will die quickly. Many still die with oxygen. Mm -hmm. The summit is gorgeous. It's a high place. It's very dangerous. All of us in here, we want to be really, really, really close with God. But in order to do that, even in a hyper grace, Disney grace age, there are certain things that must come out before you go up. Uh, kenosis is the Greek word. You have to be, you got to go through a purification thing. Not because, not to get close to God in terms of salvation, to get close to God in friendship. I don't like the word trick because it sounds demonic, but it does seem a little odd that God will entice you with an invitation to be really close with him. And as you go up the mountain, it's nothing but ouch, 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 ouch. ouch. Go to Luke 9, 23 real quick. And then I'm going to turn Wendy loose to share some revelation she shared with me. Luke 9, 23. If any man or woman desires to be my disciple, mm -hmm. wonderful. Here's what you get to do. Deny yourself, pick up the cross, which was an instrument of crucifixion, and follow me. Mm -hmm. Do you ever stop to really think about what that means? Mm -hmm. The death zone in God is the pathway of Philippians 2, it's selflessness. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest ouch we ever go through, and I'm saying it as the chief of sinners, not because I've got this thing figured out. So I, I performed a wedding ceremony of one of my best friend's daughters. It seems like she was born 10 minutes ago. Now she's getting married. It's really weird. And I do what you're supposed to do. I just pull out the little handbook here. You graduate seminary, they give you a big bill that you owe them financially, and they give you a little minister's handbook. This is called Baker's Wedding Handbook. I think you can get that on Amazon, so you don't have to go to seminary. Um, I'm just saying, if you wanted to bypass. I'm studying this the other day, and this hits me. And then Wendy had some comments, and I'm like, I think you're more connected to the Father's heart right now, and your own heart than I am. All right, so this, is, this was the wedding, and then I'm going to turn you loose. I'm going to speak in the religious tongues. That's what you're supposed to do at weddings. 
Addressing the man and woman, the minister shall say, Noah and Sarah, I charge you both as you stand in the presence of God to remember that covenant love alone will avail as the foundation of a happy and enduring home. And then this statement hit me. Let Christ, who was loyal to his own unto death, be your example. The death zone is the invitation of the Garden Greenville. That's how you shrink a church. <laughs> Tell me what your church is about. Oh, we just kill people. Uh, we want you to get close to God, and so consecration happens here, and basically God's going to kill you for a few years, and you're really going to enjoy it. I think I'm good. So you said yesterday that marriage is two becoming one. It's about me becoming one with them. And that process is painful. It's incredibly painful. Um, the ing, you know, just like in transforming, the, the most important part of that word is the ing, transforming. It means I'm consistently in that process. I don't leave it. I stay in it. So when we talk about becoming one, it's a consistent process. We stay in it. We haven't become one. We're becoming one. And so, you know, we even talked about how Jesus prayed that in John 17, may they become one as we are one, talking about the body of Christ. And so just reflecting on, on how hard the becoming is, and I think that um, it's so important to, to stay honest and hopeful at the same time. Um, and oftentimes in that death zone place, you begin, to, you begin to lose hope, right? You begin to lose hope, not just, I don't mean just with marriage, I just mean with the, with the becoming, the transforming into the likeness of Jesus, all the ings in the present tense, in the present becoming, in the present process. It's not just about what you're going to have. It's also what you're looking at. If you're like, I don't, I don't like this. I don't like the way this feels. I don't. And so it, it, can, it can find intercept, intersections of hopelessness. And yet that's where Psalm 23 is. Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I will fear no evil. For you're with me and you're, you comfort me. So our conversation two days ago was about how painful the process mm -hmm. is of dying. So Eugene Peterson, who wrote the Message Bible, he said the entire point of the spiritual life is death. I cannot tell you how many people I have triggered over the years talking about this because it makes no sense specifically to the charismatic stream. Well, because, you know, our whole message is about life. And so it feels... There's a wait what? Which is, Death. which is why I said resurrection power can only hit someone or something that's dead. Without a doubt. So what, this is, I want you to answer this. Mm -hmm. What in the world is like, well, you want me to die? What does that mean? Start using the word selflessness. Yeah. For an example. Denying yourself. For, for an example, the other night before the wedding, I met with Noah and Sarah. and I started getting words of knowledge about the purpose of marriage. And I said, the purpose of marriage is not what you think. You're about to begin a lifelong journey of death. And God has ordained marriage to kill both of you. Mm. And I love the conversation. I don't know this couple well. And they were like, all right, hang on. I know you grew up with my dad. Um, They're like, bro, we just want to have an awesome party. And who in here is not married yet? And family. All right, so you're not married yet. You, you're probably thinking, you know, I tell you what marriage is going to be because I know when I meet that person, they're going to complete me. Mm. You complete me. And we've dropped the ball on the conversation on sex in the church so bad, the church doesn't talk about it, so the devil does so much. That's why so many of our kids are confused. Mm -hmm. Sex is unbelievable in the context of biblical marriage. It's wonderful. Uh, if you think that's the purpose of marriage, you're probably going to be a little bit surprised. What you need to be asking, okay, so what is the purpose of marriage? What if 
God has ordained marriage to groom you into the image of his number one son. Mm. To give you a present place, a present, a constant season of denying yourself. <laughs> you can't get out of it. I mean, listen to this. This is the word of God. This is why it's offensive to your flesh. If it's not offending your flesh, then like, I don't know. I, Very true. Then we can be like friends at arm length. But And he was saying to them all, if anyone, this is Jesus saying this to all of them. If anyone, I love that. It's really, it's really inclusive. It's like anybody gets to do this. If anyone wishes to follow me, he must deny himself. Amplified adds, set aside selfish interests. So he must deny himself. He must set aside his interests that is about himself. And then he must take up his cross every day. Amplified says, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. In sickness and in health. In rich for richer and poor. I don't remember the rest of them. On good days and bad days. When you like me and when you don't. When you're enjoyable to talk to and when you're not. When I think we're super awesome best friends. Oh my gosh, he's my best friend. This is amazing. And then the time I'm like, uh, I could go days. <laughs> when are you leaving again? Do you know what I mean? Let's talk about Saturday. Let's get practical. I'm looking at Brett and Nicole over there. It's undeniable to leadership here. The thing that has the most fruit on it that we've done in the past year was that marriage retreat. Mm -hmm. I can tell you why. That thing was so messy. We had couples wanting to kill each other up in Ridgecrest. And one of those couples is sitting on the stage right now. All right, so what? Hello. Why was that so profitable? You want to know what that, you know, you want to know what the weekend was about? Oh, wedding and bliss. No, it was about death. It was about I swear to you, it was about death. The opening talk was a talk entitled Dirty Diapers. So let me give you an example. I'm going to give you an example. And I want, uh, let's talk about this. Saturday, Wendy and I are just at a Friday. Wendy and I are at a stage of life. We got a kid in college, which is so odd. I got one chasing his heels. And we're realizing, okay, we're about to be like, really, like Tim and Teresa, empty nesters, old people with no little people in the house. <laughs> Kevin Lutz. I mean, we're about, and we're asking honest conversations. Forget the ministry and what the Lord is doing. and Breakthrough in ministry. We're at a crossroads of who are we going to be when there are no kids and as we become less and less important at this church. Mm -hmm. And that opened the floodgates to some serious hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Talk about what does death practically look like. The first being open communication with who you're doing life with. Micah, you said up here, and I totally resonated with it. I, I personally... I believe that there's gray in the world. I believe that there's gray in the relationships and conversations. I get it. But you get gray because of black and white. Some things just are right. Some things just are wrong. Some things are just truths. Some things are just lies. And I get that they get mixed up together a lot and come up with gray. I get it. Because I'm so bent towards that, it can be very difficult for me to be the first one to apologize especially if the justice in me sees the 32 items in the conversation and I own two of them, in my opinion. If I think that I legitimately own two or three of them, then I mean the weight is, so you need to be the first one to apologize. See, that's not the way of denying yourself. See, self-interest says I'm validated. I think I'm validated, okay? I probably had like 47 issues. But I'm just saying, in that moment, you think you're valid. And what if you are? But that's not the point. The point of following Jesus. So this could be about marriage or it could be about a deeper and a higher issue, which is following Jesus. So whether I'm following Jesus in here corporately with you as we worship him together for one hour out of 168 in the week, 
or whether I'm at home in a conversation that feels really emotive and intense, am I going to follow Jesus there? Because the cost of following Jesus means that at any point, at all times, I am in a position in the becoming, in the transforming, that what I must do is deny myself. Deny what my self-interests are in that moment. And so it doesn't mean I make up reasons to apologize, but it means that I own what belongs to me. And I think that's what that was Friday. You're talking about a practical thing. Owning what belongs to you. Because it had nothing to do with marriage. It's a discipleship issue. It's a discipleship I'll issue. Close, I'll close with this, how simple it is. Wendy and I pulled up to a gas station yesterday, or two days ago, to get gas. It's one of the most repulsive smells. I still don't know what it was. I'm not sure. It smelled like a pig slop was we, around. There's no farming. I got out yeah. of, the, of the car to put gas in it, and I thought I was going to throw up. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. Everywhere I go, he makes me minister now on compost and the role of compost in that literal produce garden out there. <laughs> Think about that. What if it is true that the father, instead of trying to give you some gospel that gets you out of the mess, what if he's trying to meet you in the mess so your mess can become your message? The process of denying yourself is not denying the mess but just sitting in it and owning what's yours with you and him. Yes. For example, this morning, I felt like the Father showed me four times the amount of people at this altar that came down for that political repentance. And that's between people and God. Sometimes you understand that the gospel message is not to get you out of pain or to make this, oh, we don't need compost, compost for a garden. The process of denial is saying, I need to own what's mine. So, Father, I'm going to actually do this thing that's not popular anymore. I'm going to begin to ask you things that I need to repent on. You can be a cessationist. You'll hear God so fast, they'll call you Benny Hinn. Because he will answer that prayer so fast. Woo! We've been waiting on you to pray that. Because he's mean? No. Because when resurrection power hits dead people, you start to walk in, in a higher level the only way you ascend the mountain is descending on your knees. And descending on your knees looks like repenting of sin. So let's do this. Let's stand up. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. Right now, take about 30 seconds. What is it that you just need to deal with with him? And then just do that today.